justice, when most severe to him who has offended, is always most merciful to him who would offend. One of the more intriguing occurrences in the history of Putnam County involved the arrest, trials, and public execution of Joseph and George Brassel, on March 27, 1878. It intrigues primarily because of the coincidences involved. Mysteries of this violent conspiracy have never been fully answered. And finally, the attitudes of the community toward crime and morality are, perhaps the most vivid aspect of the entire affair. The public hanging of Joseph and George Brassel was the consequence of a conspiracy gone bad between Joe and George and at least three other men which occurred during the evening of the 29th of November, 1875. About an hour after dark, Joe Antique arrived at the house carrying a jug of whiskey and a lantern. The men then excused themselves, went outside, sat down on a nearby log, and began drinking whiskey. Since it was a cold, cloudy night, the whiskey helped to warm them. Eventually, the discussion turned to money. Jim proposed that they rob the owners of the Alice and Isabel Inn. He claimed that he knew that $4,000 was kept in the home, and $600 of that money was hidden in an old clock. To sweeten the pot, he also claimed that the Putnam County tax collector, William Jefferson Isbell, who was a stepson to the proprietor of the inn, would be spending the night there. Mr. Isbell was known to carry large sums of money in the course of his duties as county tax collector. As the whiskey flowed, they plotted their strategy. At one point, Johnson pleaded with them to lay their plan until another time. Bates responded that if they were going to do it, it would have to be done tonight as he could not return any time soon. Eventually, the details of the plan were finalized, they would rob the family of the money, but no one was to be hurt. Fortified by liquid courage, the men headed out to the Alice and Isabel home. At the last minute, Jim decided that he had better not go with them because if he was away too long he felt that his wife would become suspicious. While Jim returned home to his wife, the other four men put their plan into action. They walked about a quarter of mile along a path before they came to the main road. Traveling up the road to the corner of a field, they stopped by Joe and Teek's father's house for some supplies. Johnson and Bates waited by the field until Joe Antique returned carrying a box of blackening, short coats and two pistols, and a derringer. Joe Antique needed to don disguises as they were well known in the community. Since Bates and Johnson were unknown, they would not need them. In an attempt to disguise their features, Joe Antique daubed the blackening on their faces. Bates helped Teak to coat his face. The short coats were red and opened in the front. Joe and Teak turned them inside out before putting them on. Bates and Johnson took off their coats, turned them inside out, and put them back on. Now, satisfied that they were unrecognizable, the four men continued on to the Alice and Isabel home. In their excitement, Joe and Teak waved their pistols in the air and yelled we are bullies. Living at the Alice and Isbell home were Angeline Alice and Isbell and her second husband, James Livingston Isbell, Russell M. Russ and Joseph C. Joe Allison, Angie's two stepsons by her first marriage, Archibald Arch Bryant, a friend of Russ's, and Amanda Mandy Pippin a servant to the family and a friend of Angie's. On the night of the 29th of November, Angie and Mandy were sharing the same bed on the main floor. 
Angie had gone to bed around 9 p.m. and Mandy about an hour later. Both women were asleep by midnight. Russ and Arch were asleep in the bed upstairs, and Joe was asleep in the dining room. Neither James Isbell nor his son, William, was present in the house that night. Earlier in the afternoon, William sent word to Angie that he would be staying the night, but something prevented his arrival and he stayed elsewhere. The house was completely dark except for the fire in the fireplace. Shortly before midnight, the four conspirators arrived at the Alice and Isbell home. They had traveled along the main road until they got within 200 to 300 yards of the house. As they entered the yard, the Brassels took the lead. The commotion in the room caused both Angie and Mandy to rise up in the bed to see what was happening. Angie screamed in the name of God, Joe and Teak Braswell are you going to kill us all? Joe raced over to the foot of the bed and pointed his pistol at Angie. Angie grabbed the covers, pulled them up over her head, and fell back into the bed screaming. Mandy's hands flew to her face, and she too fell back into the bed screaming. Joe fired his pistol. Fortunately, the ball completely missed both women and lodged in the bedding. Arch, in the upstairs bedroom upon hearing the gunshots below, quickly scrambled out the window and hung by his fingertips on the window's ledge. Joe Allison who was asleep in the dining room, awoke in time to see his brother running through the door. Realizing that their plan had gone completely awry, the intruders hastily departed exiting out the same door in which they entered, leaving their victims in critical conditions. Russ died on the 1st of December 1875 between the hours of 11 a.m. and 12 p.m., he lingered 36 hours before he succumbed. As the criminals were leaving the open hall, Bates shot several times in the yard ostensibly at a dog. They crossed the yard and headed to the main road. They went up the road a short distance from the house and stopped to catch their breath. Teak proposed that they go back and kill the old lady and the rest of the family to keep them from identifying them. Bates said that they had already done enough that night. They traveled along the road for a short distance when they passed Mr. Henry Thompson, who was returning home with his team of oxen. Eventually, the conspirators stopped at a fork in the road to discuss what they had just done. Teak said that he believed that he killed Russell Allison, Neither he nor Joe believed that they would be arrested for their crime their disguises had saved them from being recognized, or so they thought. The men parted ways. Joe and Teak spent the night at their father's house, while Bates and Johnson spent the night at Jim's house. By the time they arrived at their respective destinations, the time was nearly 1 a.m. By the evening of the 30th, Word had spread around the county about the shooting of Russell Allison. The community was outraged. Constable James K.P. Stewart assembled a posse of five to six men to apprehend Joe and Teague at the Brassel farm. An arrest warrant issued for the apprehension of Dahl Bates. Monroe Flowers Doss, the sheriff of DeKalb County was assigned the task of locating and arresting Bates. Doss tracked Bates for almost a month before locating him. Once Bates was arrested, the sheriff took him to the Nashville jail to join the Brassel brothers. During their trial, the witnesses were sworn in by John Jarrett and gave testimony before the grand jury. On Wednesday the 16th of February 1876, the grand jury issued a true bill of indictment for Joseph L. Brassel, George A. Brassel, 
and William B. Bates for the murder in the first degree of Russell Allison on the 30th of November 1875. On Thursday the 17th of February 1876, Attorney General Morgan made a motion that Dobson Johnson should have to provide security to ensure his presence at the trial. Johnson, along with his father David acting as his security, was indebted to the state of Tennessee for $250 if he failed to appear. The following Monday the 21st of February 1876, Joe, Teak and Bates were arraigned before the circuit court. All plead not guilty. Due to the strong feelings of resentment in county, the court felt it was unsafe for the Brassels and Bates to remain at the Coquiville jail. Again, they were to be transported safely to the jail in Nashville and housed there until their trial date. During this session of the circuit court, the grand jury also returned a true bill of indictment against Teak Brassel for murder in the second degree of John J. Allison. Both brothers were sentenced to die by hanging. On the 27th of March 1878, Small, rural Coquiville, Tennessee gained national attention with the public hanging of brothers Joseph Louis Brassel and George Andrew Teak, Brassel for the murders of brothers Russell M. Allison and John James Allison in November 1875. According to the 1880 census, Putnam County had 11,500 inhabitants living within her boundaries. On the day of the hanging, crowds swelled to an estimated at 10,000 to 12,000 in Coquiville alone. One newspaper account placed the estimate as high as 20,000. In 1907, the Putnam County Herald recalled the observations of some of its older citizens who said that it was the largest crowd ever seen in Coquiville. The event was not just limited to the menfolk, but women and children attended as well. Newspaper reporters from around the country descended on the city to report on the hanging. Frustrated of this and all other exits from their grim condition, the Brassel boys at last had to face the hemp. It would be the only judicial hanging in the history of Putnam County, Tennessee. The execution itself occurred on a Wednesday. On the Sabbath preceding, the local Sunday school's curriculum included a visit to the condemned cells, where prisoners and children sang Let Us Cross Over the River. Both brothers were hanged on the same scaffold on the 27th of March 1878. Thank you for watching Death Row.